Hey everybody, welcome back to another episode of The Fix, a podcast about Lightroom, Photoshop, post-processing, and the cool and creative things we get to do with our images after the shoot. I'm Sean Duggan, your host, and my guest this week is photographer and photography author Alan Hess, and we're going to be talking about something that Alan does quite a lot of and something that he does very well, concert photography. Alan's going to be sharing some of the favorite images that he's made over the years, as well as some behind-the-scenes stories about what it's like to be photographing a live event like a rock and roll concert, as well as sharing some cool Lightroom post-processing tips. Stay with us. Well, Alan Hess, welcome to The Fix. Thank you very much for taking the time to join me. How's it going? It's going good. It's uh, my pleasure to be here. So you're you're down in beautiful San Diego. Is that right? Yeah, it's a, it's a tough life. Uh, the weather's always good and um, everyone wants to be here. So uh, Yeah. I, <laughs> I was down I was down there in in June with my family and uh, I hadn't been there in a while, and it just reminded me what a great, great place it is. I'm looking forward to going back in November because I'm going to be uh, speaking at Adobe Max, so I get to go again. So yeah, we got we got the big Adobe conference this year. Um, I think it's a I think it's a good choice for them to come down to San Diego. It, it's going to be a, it's going to be fun. I'm hoping to actually make it down for yeah. part of that. Uh, so you and I last saw each other at, at Photoshop World about a month ago, uh, and then uh, the last I heard from you uh as as that was breaking up is that you were heading off to comic-con so what were you doing there were you there in an in official capacity or just because it's a cool scene uh, uh both um yeah it seems like that was like three or four years ago already i mean time is time just went was crazy but it, it was a it was an insane week i went to las vegas for a photoshop world and presented for the 12th time since 2000 is 2009 um wow. Yeah, uh, low light photography, concert photography. Um, those are my those are my subjects, and uh, they have me back. And it was great. It was a really nice crowd. Everyone was fantastic. I had a really good time. But I had to leave early uh, Thursday morning. I flew out uh, bright and early at six o'clock during the day that Southwest Airlines was having day two of their flight problems. So I got to spend yep. um, a fun time in the airport, freaking out if I was going to get to San Diego or not. Uh, arrived in San Diego. Uh, my wife picked me up. I came home, changed camera bags, uh, pretty much grabbed a handful of new memory cards and off to the convention center for four days. Um, wow. And I've been going to Comic-Con. I'm a, I'm a true geek. I have geek credibility going back for years. My first Comic-Con was in uh, 1984. I was in high school and I went as part of the masquerade um, and I dressed as a giant elf. So this is, you know, breaking <laughs> news here. I was a six foot elf in masquerade and comic con in, in back in 1984. And I, it, it was just so much fun. Um, it's a lot different now than it was then, but yeah. it's still, it's still geek central. So what I did uh, two of the days out of the four days, um, I was working as a photographer covering um, Fox and FX TV shows. Uh, oh. I work, I work on the floor of the convention center in their booth. Uh, covering, photographing the signings and the giveaways and all the stuff that happens right in the middle of the people. Um, I used to do all the press rooms and I used to do the panels and honestly, it got a little like too much like work. Um, standing, yeah. in a, standing in a room with a bunch of other photographers waiting for people to come in to stand up against the background just was like, this is work. This isn't fun anymore. So now yeah. I try to cover, um, I try to cover the, the crowds down on the actual convention floor and I think we had 160 to 170,000 people going to the convention over the four days and it gets uh, a little nuts. Amazing. Um, but yeah, so it's, it's a, it's kind of high pressure. I shoot really fast. I don't edit any of my own stuff from Comic-Con. Uh, it goes straight to runners who take it to the Fox editors. They work in the Hilton, one of the, um, the hotel rooms and they get it out on the Fox, uh, and FX news wires, uh, within minutes of it happening. I mean, it's, it's oh, the wow. deadlines are crazy. Um, so yeah, I, I went from Las Vegas for four days to Comic Con for four days to sleeping for four days. Um, <laughs> I bet but, you the sleeping was uh, was really welcome by. Then. Oh, it, you know it was it was it was crazy. I, they never it was just really weird. We had the MLB All Star Game in San Diego this year, and uh, Photoshop World was moved earlier, and so everything kind of aligned to be on the same week, um, which has never happened yeah. before. And usually I have a couple of weeks between them, so. 
It was yeah, a, Photoshop World was a lot earlier this week, or this year. Right. It was a lot earlier in the summer. Yeah, they seemed to, they moved it in August. I mean, it was uh, people like, oh my God, Vegas is so hot. I mean, I don't know. I never went outside. I went from my hotel yeah. room to the convention center. Uh, I might have stopped by the House of Blues or Eye Candy Bar once or twice. Um, we definitely yeah. hung out at the at the Irish pub. I mean, sorry, restaurant. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, it was great. Uh, it was. Um, I had a really good time, and and that convention has become a lot about meeting the new attendees. You know, having uh, different classes and definitely catching up with old friends. So it was. It was. Uh, yeah. It was that part of it was just unbeatable. Um, well, you know, I, I'm like you. I, I I never went outside. Well, once I went outside well, when I went between uh, Mandalay Bay and Luxor on the little monorail. When I got out of the monorail and then it was outside the Sphinx, and I quickly went inside. That was the only time I went outside. But you know, I was paying attention to the the little uh, health app on the iPhone. And in the the four days that I was there, I walked like eighteen and a half miles. Oh, yeah. just just inside. <laughs> <laughs> we, um, I have a Fitbit. I got one last year before Photoshop World, um, a- after Comic Con, because uh, my buddy comes from South Carolina, North Carolina. He comes to visit me. He works as well, and he was like, "Oh, you got to count how many steps you walk." And I'm like, "Well, that's crazy." So uh, this year, I, I I tracked that week, and I had uh, twenty five thousand steps plus a day every day for the eight days. Um, it's the most I've walked, I think in my life in, in a week. Yeah, I know. Um, but it, it kind of becomes like kind of a badge of honor, you know, I, how many steps did you get today? Oh, I, I broke 25,000 steps, you know, I did. Uh, and I, and I, that was literally from my hotel room, uh, to the convention center and back. Um, uh, and I'm one of the people, you know, you check in in Vegas and they were like, well, do you want a high st- floor? Do you know, you want the view? And I'm like, no, no, you can put me on like the third floor as close to the elevator as possible. You know, if I can save yeah. 20 minutes of walking, I'm, I'm good with it. I've seen yeah, what I know. Vegas looks like. So, yeah, it's crazy. Um, so, so at the, uh, the, you did a concert photography pre-con at, at Photoshop world, right? Well, we, we used to, we didn't do it this year. We, we took a break. Um, we have done it 10 times over the last, uh, Oh, since 2009. And I usually, uh, I teach with Scott DeUsa from Nikon, but they were all gearing up for the Olympics and there were some uh, new people coming in. So we, we gave it a skip, um, which is actually kind of nice for me. I got to go and look at some, some classes I'd never seen before. And I got to be able to see some instructors I'd never seen before. Um, I right. saw Kaylee, Kaylee Greer who did uh, from dog breath photography. She did something on photographing animals, which is really, uh, very dear to me. So it was kind of fun to be able to, to see other people present. But yeah, usually we we did a, a live concert shoot where we would go through all the classroom stuff. Then we would actually photograph a band and then we would come back and talk about post-processing and, and uh, all that, right. you know, fun computer stuff. Um, and I still do a concert class, which is uh, an abbreviated hour long version, um, which is always interesting for me to figure out what to put in and what to take out because it turns out that an hour is not going to quite cut it. Um, yeah. It's so what I did this year... Yeah. So what I did this year, I thought was interesting is I put most of it, I put everything that I thought was really important, like for them to look at later in the class notes, they had to have it in the book. And then during the class, yeah. I, I kind of went over some of that, but I also talked a few, you know, a few more stories and a little bit more on composition, the stuff that's not so easy to write about. That's a little bit more visual. Um, so the people who, yeah, yeah, sure. yeah, the people who came to class got a little, a little extra and everyone who went to the conference can always look up the class notes in the book, which is, I think one of the best things about Photoshop world is I have uh, somewhere on that shelf behind me. I have um, the workbooks going back to like 2002. Right. Um, yeah. And uh, I still yeah, use no, they're good. They're great resources. Um, so. so tell me, uh, you, you've been, you know, you've been doing concert photography for a long time. You're, you're, you're very well known for that. Although you've done a lot of other things, you've, you've yeah. authored like 15 books <laughs> on various photography subjects. And, and of course we'll, we'll put links to, to those in the show notes, but you know, regarding concert photography, which is, I'm sure an area that a lot of people would are probably interested in. Probably a lot of people think it's a cool thing to do. Uh, how did you get started in that? Uh, it's um, part of it was that I just enjoyed going to concerts. I went to a lot of concerts. I still enjoy going to concerts. Um, I probably go to more shows now than I ever have in the past, but I don't get to stay the whole show. Back when I was starting out, um, uh, there was this little band called the Grateful Dead, and I was a big fan, <laughs> and they allowed photography. 
So as long as you didn't annoy anyone and you didn't, you know, become a pain in the ass, they, they let you take your camera into the show and shoot whatever you wanted to shoot. Now, this is, of course, back in the days of film. So there was actual cost involved yeah. with, with taking a picture. Um, but I got really hooked of matching my love of the music with my new, like, burgeoning love of photography. Um, mm -hmm. I've, I've never thought of myself as an artist and, like, you know, I'm, I'm kind of useless with a pen or pencil. But I found that I had a kind of an eye for photography. I started getting the idea that I could capture one moment and would bring back, like, the whole show or that song. Um, and since I could do it and the band didn't care, I started doing it quite a bit. Um, and then later on in life, uh, I had a lot of friends in bands. And so I was starting to bring my camera to shoot the small clubs and the little bars and all my musician friends. And it was kind of like, it turned out it was a lot more challenging than it looked to be. I'd, I'd seen, you know, Annie Leibovitz and, you know, some of these like famous pictures from the sixties and it looked, Oh yeah, that looks so easy. And then, um, I'm standing in a bar where there's no light and, you know, it's like one red light bulb somewhere and I'm, I'm shooting, you know, 800 speed film and everything's coming out dark. And I'm like, I don't understand, you know, um, why this is, you know, not working. Um, one of my favorite memories of me screwing up is when I first saw exposure compensation on a button on a camera. And it was like, yes, you can, you can press this button and turn the knob and then the pictures will be brighter or darker. Now, I, of course I thought it was magic. I didn't realize it was actually just going to change some of the settings for me without telling me what they were going to do. So I spent the entire day right. like dialing in plus three exposure compensation so that it would be brighter. And then, you know, everything that I shot was blurry because it was using a, you know, two second shutter speed, <laughs> but it was film. You know, I, I didn't know, I didn't know what was going on. Um, I kind of had a, you know, so I, I kind of started teaching myself because there were no books on the subject. There were no resources. It wasn't like today where you had instant feedback on the camera. I'd have to take right. that roll of slide film out and I, I spent, Oh, ten dollars for the film, and then I handed it to get developed, and I spent another ten dollars only to get back thirty six really blurry exposures. And I'm like, what did I do wrong? So I, it was kind of like um, I just taught myself how to do it, and for a long time it was just a hobby. Uh, yeah. And then so one day I realized that the job I had wasn't going to be around forever, and I needed to start doing something else. And I started turning the hobby into something that I'm now do full time. Um, yeah. Cool. Uh, and so, so flash forward to the present, you, you're, you're now uh, doing this regularly. You're, you're the, um, the house photographer at a, at a large concert venue in Southern California. So you're, you're doing photography there on a regular basis. Yeah. I, the, the, it's, it used to be called the San Diego sports arena. And um, most people know it as a San Diego sports arena. It's the big round building on sports arena Boulevard, but it's now uh, the official name is the Valley view casino center. Um, and we have, mm -hmm. We have uh, events, we have concerts. Um, we, you know, I shot in the last couple of years, we've had Cher, we've had Madonna, we've had the Red Hot Chili Peppers, we, Roger Waters did the wall in, in the building. Um, I also learned oh, how to- I would love to see that. Oh, I, that's literally one of my all time favorite shows ever. Um, I was also the one that I got the least amount of sleep the night before trying to figure out how I was gonna capture this iconic show, you know, in three or four songs. Cause that's about yeah. all I get to shoot. Oh, okay. um, so yeah, I, I had a lot of Leslie, but it, it turned out it was great. One of my favorite images is from that show. Um, uh, but we also, I've also learned how to shoot hockey. Um, we've had uh, indoor soccer. I shot indoor, f uh, football arena, uh, football arena league. The other night we had a uh, LA kiss had to come and play their game in San Diego. So I learned how to shoot that. Um, I've shot the Lakers. Um, we've had the Harlem Globetrotters. I've had Disney on ice. I've had world wrestling. So it's gone from just shooting concerts to shooting all kinds of live events. Um, yeah. The reality is that most of the settings are identical because the lighting is still low and the action is still fast. So I'm right. Uh, yeah. You know, the, the secret, if anyone wants to know is I shoot at 1600 ISO. I started 250 of the second and I shoot at F 2.8. And I, I literally work from that. That is, that is about the, the basics. If you want to, if you want to shoot a concert, start there. Um, and, and, and I saw from, um, I, I watched a part of your uh, course on Kelby one training on concert photography. And, and uh, you said that most of the time you're shooting with like a 70 to 200 lens, something like that. Yeah. It's my fair. My, you know, everyone has their own, um, 
like after a while, I mean, I, I, when you start, you're not really sure, but after a while you start finding that you get a favorite look or a favorite kind of thing. I, I've always been a fan of those uh, compressed backgrounds, um, uh, maybe because I shot in bars and the backgrounds were really bad. So I wanted to have as little <laughs> of the background in as possible. I learned um, uh, that not only do I get the nice reach with a, with a 200 millimeter um, focal length, but I also get this really cool compression where the little of the background, I can see my hands, you know, as, as you yeah. get along the focal length, it just captures less of the background. So for my style, it was always about getting just the performer and avoiding a lot of the backgrounds. The, the weird part is that as I shoot for the venue, as a venue photographer, there are times where I need to force myself to shoot wide, 20 millimeter, 35 millimeters, so that I'm actually showing more of the stage, more of the surroundings, because that's what they're looking for in some of their marketing material, you know, especially sure, if you've got yeah. a packed house. Um, but I, I'm, I, think it's a, I think it's important um, for photographers to start seeing what they actually like to shoot. And I think it's one of the reasons you get a style is if you start looking at my pictures and you realize that they're all filling the frame with the performer and not really wide angle and they don't have any of that edge distortion, that just became like kind of the style that I really enjoyed as my work. I have a lot of friends who shoot with the like 14 to 24 millimeter right up front to get that really wide view of everything. And it's like, that doesn't suit me. It's not, I'm not comfortable doing it. It's not how I represent myself. So yeah, most of my pictures are taken with a 20, with a 70 to 200. Um, if I was only, if I, they're like, okay, you can only have one camera and one lens. It would be the 70 to 200 2.8. Um, yeah, it might be a 400 to eight if, you know, if, if I could have, Ford didn't have it with me all the time, but, um, yeah. you know, that's, uh, so, so, you know, w w one thing that occurred to me and I've done, you know, I've done some performance photography in the past, probably about, you know, as, as much as most people have, I think, you know, all photographers get called upon, you know, through people they know or whatever to, to photograph the occasional performance. You know, I haven't you know done it extensively, but, you know, I, I'm, I'm familiar with some of the, uh, some of the challenges that pop up, but one thing that that uh, question that occurred to me when I knew that you were going to be coming on was when you're in there photographing in a conscious situation, when you're you know you're in the zone, the the, the photo zone, to making pictures. How aware are you of the actual concert, like the songs? <laughs> like, oh, that's my fa that's my favorite song. You know. Um. <laughs> uh, that's that's interesting. Um. I'm not, uh, it's weird. I, if someone goes, um, wow, what did they play? I, I'll, I, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not a hundred percent sure <laughs> while I'm, while I'm actually photographing and it's a band. Now I photograph a lot of different bands and I don't know all the songs that all the bands play. Some of them, I have no idea what their songs are. I tried to look them up beforehand on YouTube or, um, just to get an idea of what the music's like. Uh, but I, I shot uh, Cage the Elephant, really, really high energy, fantastic show, brilliant lights. I have no idea what three songs they played that we shot. While they were going on, I'm paying attention to things that I'm noticing about the song. Um, does the does the lead singer, you know, can I figure out where the beat is? Can I figure out where the change is? Is there going to be a guitar solo? That kind of stuff, which is a lot yeah. easier when it's a song or a band I know. I photograph, yeah. you know, the Who. Um, uh, a couple of months ago, I, knew, I saw the first three songs. I know all three songs. I can pretty much figure out who's going to be where doing what. When, I, when it's done with, they're like, how did you enjoy those songs? And my brain is like, I, I don't know. I, I was kind of caught up. I mean, I, I found myself singing along, but I also find myself waiting for the moment. I'm always looking for that. I, I know it's a kind of a cliche term in photography, but I'm looking for that decisive moment. I'm looking for that one split second or 250th of a second that when you look at will bring you back to the whole show or to bring you back to like, at least that you were part of it, that there was something going on. Um, yeah. so for me, that is a little bit about like, where is the highlight in the music? What's going on with it? But the reality is that, um, I have missed huge amounts of music by photographing them because I am enjoying it in the moment, but I have no clue as to what actually happened afterwards. And someone said, Oh my God, I can't believe they played blah, blah, blah song. And I'd be like, huh? I, I don't know. I don't remember that at all. Um, That's interesting. So, so you have probably been 
through through your job as a as a you know performing arts photographer, live event photographer, whatever you you probably have been to way more concerts than most people have, and yet you're not experiencing them in the same way. So you don't have that as much of a memory of of what really was happening. Right. I mean, recently. But you have the yeah, re- I mean, recently there were there were two shows um, that stand out because they're both artists that I love, and uh, not only did I photograph the first three songs, I then actually stayed for the whole show. So um, we had Tom Petty come through town with his uh, other band called Mud Crutch, um, and they played a small venue. Photographed the first three, uh, put my cameras in my bags, and basically went and um, hung out with my wife and friends for the rest of the show, and it was fantastic. But I couldn't tell you what the first three songs were. I can tell you the rest yeah, of the show. I just can't remember that first part. And, um, and I, as I mentioned, The Who, they came back through um, on their 50th anniversary tour a couple of months ago uh, for a show that was supposed to be last year, but got postponed um, due to Roger Waters' health issues. I mean, um, sorry, Roger Daltrey's health issues. So when they played it this time, um, we shot the first three songs again. Again, I packed up my camera bag. It was locked in the office, and I went and... Uh, Based on my wife and I had tickets and we watched the rest of the show. It was a fantastic show, but I don't remember right now what the first three songs were. Um, I remember the rest of the show, um, but I don't yeah. remember what I actually shot. And everyone was all like, oh, did you take any video or did you use your cell phone? Do you? I'm like, no, I shot three songs and then I just enjoyed the show. So, um, well, so that's, that, that, that's actually interesting. That, 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 uh, that point has come up a, a few times here. So before we get into the, the screen share, I'm, I'm taking a look at some of your work and, and some of the processing tips that you have to share about it. Um, you, you mentioned a couple times that, you know, oftentimes you're, you're given a window of three or four songs for, to photograph the event. Right. And, and that's, you're not photographing that's right. throughout the entire concert, as I understand it. Uh, 90% of the time I photograph the first three songs um, and then uh, we're done. Um, There are some bands that I work with and there's some, some who've been really nice and I get to photograph uh, everything I, I want for as long as I want. Um, I'm photographing, I'll be up with Steel Pulse, a reggae band this Saturday. They're playing up in Orange County. I'm going up. uh, I have carte blanche to shoot whatever I want with them on the stage, off the stage, whatever, but it's really rare. Most of the time you're limited to three songs, the first three songs, and then you're done. Um, a lot of the country uh, guys, it seems to be, it's the first two songs and then you're done. And a lot of artists are now going, it's two or three songs, but from the soundboard, like halfway in the back of the room from when the lighting guy and controls wow. the sound. So, uh, um, we get that a lot too, which is a little bit more restrictive because you're basically looking directly at the stage from one point and the only way you're going to get different images from any, well, you're not going to get different images from other people shooting right next to you, but the only way you're going to get anything different is if the artist actually moves um, on the stage um, and doesn't just stay in one position. Um, But yeah, it's, it's much more, people think that it's like this really big rock and roll lifestyle that I go to the show and I hang out with the band and then I shoot, you know, whatever I want. And I, it's not that at all. We get escorted into the building before the show starts. Um, we're controlled where we go. Uh, when we're done shooting, usually, especially for the bigger shows that I shoot, we're escorted out of the building. So unless we have a review ticket or we're allowed to come back in for some other reason, we're, we're in the show for three songs and then we're home. There's, there's a lot of times I'm done editing images and the show is still going on. Um, so yeah, it's not as a, it's, it's not quite that, you know, rock and roll party lifestyle that people think it might be. Um, and, and so I'm guessing that um, that the reason that there's that stipulation that you're photographing whatever the first two or three songs is that they want they want to get the photography part out of the way so that it's not a distraction to the performances is, or the performers is that the rationale there? There's there's, there's been a there's been a lot of uh, people credited with coming up with the with the rule. Um, I've heard some inside stories, which I, which I won't share publicly. Um, certain performers uh, don't like the way they looked after a certain amount of time. There was a little, you know, sweat, hair wasn't quite a perfect, you know, things like that. Uh, also, back, right, when it, right. back, when, back when it started and, you know, when, when rock and roll really like took over 60s and the 70s and they were having these big shows, a lot of times it was newspaper guys in the front and they were using a flash on the camera, blasting away so, and then running out of there so they could go back and make the paper deadline. So a lot of times yeah. it, it was kind of a self-enforced, you know, they were just going to do it. Um, and performers didn't really like the flashes going off in front or the 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 people who didn't really care about it. Most of the music photographers I know nowadays, we wear all black. We 
don't use a flash in the photo pit because it's not allowed. We try to be unobtrusive. We, we are literally, if the band is noticing us and they're not noticing the, um, the, the fans, then we're doing something wrong. At least that's always been my uh, personal interpretation of it is I don't want to be, um, I stand right between the band and the, and the fans. Yeah. I don't want to, I don't want to interrupt the energy between the two because that's what makes a good show. When the band is having fun and the fans are having fun, I should just be like invisible to everyone. Um, yeah. But a lot of bands, you know, they, they, yeah, that's just, they don't want you sitting there for an hour and a half, two hours, you know, photographing every sweat drop that comes off, you know, sure. later on. Right. And, um, a lot or of times that moment when they might, uh, that moment when they might inadvertently strike a pose and look like the incredible Hulk. <laughs> yeah. Well, I, I know exactly what you're talking about. That was, uh, you see, and, and I, I, I do want to address that because that one's kind of interesting. Um, the other side of it is that I take a lot of pictures that are really bad. I, they're, they're, the focus is off. The, the facial expression is off. If something just happened in the photograph that just, is just horrible. You'll never see them. No one will ever see them because my job on the editing side of things is to make sure that doesn't happen. Now the person, I don't know who took that photograph um, of that performer looking like the incredible Hulk, mm -hmm. but that never should have made it out, out. of, out of the camera or, or onto the wires or anywhere else. I understand that it was a moment in the show and they probably didn't think that it was going to end up being turned into an internet meme, but it did. Um, yeah. and it literally changed, um, the way that that artist allows photography. Yeah. Um, and, and not only that artist, other artists who went, Oh, I don't want that to happen. So now we want the rights to look at all the images before they get posted and we want to own everything beforehand. So it turned into kind of a, kind of a battle. And I, I actually think the editor and photographer on that one should have been like, well, that's great. I'll keep it for my memoirs or something, but it never yeah. should have been allowed out. Um, one of the reasons that I'm invited back to shoot bands that I shoot is that I don't post pictures that are going to embarrass them or make them look stupid. My job is to make them look great. And I always, yeah. I always assume, and this is just goes through my head. It's only happened a couple of times in my entire life. I always assume that the artist is going to see the image. They usually don't, mm -hmm. but I always assume yeah. that they're going to, and I don't want to be the guy who has to try to ex try to explain it. And, um, before we go on to the editing stuff, we had, uh, Garth Brooks play five shows in four nights at our venue last year. As a photographer, I was allowed to shoot the first night, the second half of the first song, and the first half of the second song. Oh, wow. From the soundboard. So <laughs> I, got, I got about four and a half minutes, five minutes of actual shooting time in. From that, the venue wanted two images to put up on the walls that are printed 22 feet long by 12 feet tall that wrapped the inside of the walls. So I came home, I edited the, my favorite five or six images. I sent them to my boss. She picked the, the two that I thought would make the best wall wraps. We sent them off to the printer. They put them up on the wall on so that was Thursday night. They were up on the wall by this, by Saturday afternoon. And on Sunday evening, I was back at the venue and we had Garth Brooks actually sign one of them. It's on the wall. It's literally a wall wrap and he signed it. So for one, oh, of, the first, great. So one of the first times I actually had the artist standing in front of the image of him that I took. And, um, I'm really proud of it. I'm proud of the image and that's one of the reasons that it's up there. So it doesn't happen very often, but every image that I put out, I'd be very happy for the artist to see. And I wouldn't feel like I would have to explain to them what I was thinking or doing. All right. Um, yeah. I, I think a lot of photographers would make their work a lot better if they just thought about that a little bit beforehand and didn't just post, Oh, this one's really fun. Or that one's kind of funny looking. A lot of performers are kind of uh, very particular about how they like to be portrayed. And, um, well, I mean, th th that's understandable too. I mean, I think everybody, everybody is to some degree, you know, we all have pictures that have been taken out of us just in regular circumstances where, you know, that are less than flattering or, or whatever. We got a weird expression on our face. That's only human, I think. But as you say, a lot of, a lot of that comes down to good editing, not only just choosing which pictures you're going to put out there, but also, uh, massaging them and fine tuning them to make them look better in, you know, the, post-processing workflow and apropos that <laughs> you want to dive in and we'll take a look at some of your images and sure and you can Let's show see. us some stuff i'm gonna fire up your screen share and we'll dive in all right so i'm gonna talk about a couple of my images that are that are, they may not be my favorite images of all time but they they all have definitely something going on for them that i that i really just enjoy and um most of these have made it into my portfolio throughout the years uh, sometimes they get moved out sometimes they get moved back in but 
Um, they're all, they're all moments that I really, really enjoy. And I keep going back to them. Um, some are new and some are older. This is a, a shot, um, of a band called Switchfoot that is uh, based here in San Diego. They were doing one of the middle slots of a festival, uh, at my venue. Um, and the energy of this band was just spectacular, but trying to capture the energy in a single shot was just really, really difficult because they were all over the place and it just looked busy. Um, when this shot happened, uh, I was really up close. Um, I was shooting a little wider than I normally do. And he just dropped to his knees right in front of me. And the fact that guitar is incredibly sharp down here on the, on the bottom part, uh, really just kind of like, I'm like, Oh, that's great. Cause it kind of, his hand got a little blurry. It was a little bit out of focus at two, eight from about three inches away. Your depth of field is so minuscule that, um, uh, the blur, uh, drops off really quickly. So the basic, you can't even see who it is. Um, I know it's, a, uh, uh, I know it's switch, but I shot the show. Um, but I was watching, um, for me, it's all about this just motion in it and just the energy coming in. Now, one of the things I did on this was I did, uh, kind of burn in the edges around him a little bit so that the focus would be directly on, um, the musician. I don't do a lot of editing as in removing or adding things into the picture, but I will play with the exposure and I will dodge and burn. Um, when I need to, yeah. uh, this was kind of the, the exact opposite. Um, this was, uh, the black keys. And for this one, um, it was just a mellow light. All I noticed, um, when I started shooting him was those cool lights in the background. So having those, those spots, um, in the background, kind of like, I wonder if I can get those lined up in the picture. So I spent, um, probably a little more time than I should have, uh, lining up the shot and, uh, waiting for him to just move a little bit back off the microphone so that I could get, uh, those little, the four little lights in the background. I also had to wait for them not to be quite as bright. Uh, I shoot everything in manual mode. So I'm, I'm able to control my exposures uh, much tighter than letting the camera do it, uh, which allowed me to have things that are backlit. Uh, one of my pet peeves. Sure. Uh, sure. Just, just a quick question. So when you're doing a, you know, obviously photographs of people singing right. are, are tricky sometimes because you know, the facial expression and the mouth expression, you know, sometimes when it's frozen at that, you know, one two fiftieth of a second can sometimes look awkward. So are you like looking for those moments where they're holding a note or there's that pause in the, in the beat to, to, to get kind of a good expression on the face? Yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's great. That's exactly what I do. Um, I usually wait for them to pull back from the microphone a little bit. Um, I want the idea that he's singing, but I don't need to have the microphone directly in front of his directly over his lips. And a lot of, a lot of musicians come really close to the microphone. So I will sit there and I will, I will wait until I see them pulling back. Um, if I know the song, it's easier. If I don't know the song, I've got to, I've got to pay a little bit more attention to what's going on. Um, the problem with microphones is not just the, the microphone itself. You can see that it's a couple inches away from his mouth in this picture, but the microphone stand is, is coming right through the guitar neck. Um, yeah. and that, that drives me crazy. So I tend to shoot from either the left or right. I don't tend, I don't like to shoot straight on because I like to be able to get the whole instrument in. Um, this one's close enough because his hand is lower on the guitar neck. So I don't feel like it's losing anything, but I can see all of him and the, and the microphone is there. I mean, I know, I know Photoshop guys who would, who could edit out that microphone in probably 30 seconds, but to me, it's part of the image. He is singing. So, um, uh, I leave it in. Yeah. Uh, don't always have to uh, show the performer's face. Um, I love this shot just because of the fans. Um, they were exceedingly excited uh, um, yeah. and the facial expressions. And I always look for things that tell a story and having the, having the facial expressions of, of these fans. Um, and I will say they were mostly women uh, screaming up uh, while he was performing on a little stage um, was kind of interesting. This was shot on a tiny little platform that he put up in the general admit, uh, behind the soundboard. So um, the fans didn't know that he was going to come out there and do the first song. We were told. So we were, we were actually uh, by the soundboard and we were shooting back towards the general admission crowd. And uh, he's singing to the people in the sheep seats. And um, for me, it was oh, wow. for me. Yeah, and the light was one spotlight coming on behind us. You can kind of see it's much brighter on one side of his shirt than the other. And uh, there was a couple of lights down below on the stage, which gave us light on the fans' faces. And for me, that that became my favorite shot of the night. Uh, I know a lot yeah, of fans are like, 
you know, oh, he's just, you know, it's a cute butt. I'm like, okay, great. But it's, it's, the, it's the interaction. I'm always looking for um, something that's telling more of a story. Um, yeah, well, I think it really captures a lot of the energy of that concert, you know. So I'm going to, uh, this is, this is my non non live performance shot that I'm thrown in here because it was done doing a music video uh, film out in the desert. Uh, this is Wolf Hoffman from the band accept. And, um, I've shot them live uh, many times. Uh, I've also, we shot the whole video. This was done at about four or five in the morning. It was about negative three degrees and he had to wear a t-shirt, um, because it was going to be in the same clothes all day. But I approach this exactly as I would have approached the live shot. I was standing back with a 70 to 200 behind the video crew. And I was just waiting till something looked like it was a, a, the moment. And um, I'm really proud of the shot. It actually ended up selling to the guitar manufacturer and they ended up using it in ads um, for the uh, famous right, guitars. Cool. Uh, and it's a, it's a very... Nice. You know, yeah, it's a great shot. It's got a great, uh, the funny part is if you go look in guitar magazines and you see the shot used in an ad, they took out the mountain and put in amplifier. So it looks like it's on stage. Um, so it, it, was, <laughs> it was shot during a performance. The performance just happened to be for a video and not an actual live, um, live show. He's, he's one of the best people to photograph though. It's always, always a, a good, um, a good shot. Um, so Rush came through our venue a couple of years ago. Uh, this was one of my uh, favorite shots from that night. We, we blew this one up. Uh, it's, one of the, it's this one or, one or one really similar to it. We blew it up 22 feet long by 16 feet wide, and it wraps one of the walls of the sports arena. And the, the Fender Jazz Bass, um, I'm pointing to the screen, the Fender Jazz Bass part over here goes, actually goes over one of the restroom doors when you're walking around the building. And I just thought it was a really nice, <laughs> uh, <laughs> just kind of a, a nice, um, composition on it now this is one of those shots where i was i knew we wanted to put a rush shot up uh, in the building and i knew it had to be a little wider so i was shooting a lot closer than i usually do and i was shooting at, a, at, a, at an angle that i'm not usually used to shooting at about um i want to say i was shooting with the 20 to 35 millimeter lens that's kind of my 2.8 it's kind of my go-to wide angle lens um so probably somewhere in 35 millimeter range and i was shooting straight up at the stage uh, as close um as possible something i don't usually do but i knew where it was going to go so i composed this image because i knew it had to be long and wide to wrap around the wall um and uh i really just love the expression on his face and the fact that the fingers are just right on the base you can see the thumb uh right in here pushing down on the string um you know, and I'm not yeah. a musician, but I know what musicians look for. And that's kind of the thing that always seems to, you know, make them happier. So, um, and we left, I, I knew where it was going to go. So I did leave a lot of blank space over the side where my watermark is. Cause I knew there was going to be a door going over there. So <laughs> we weren't going to wrap into the, uh, into the bathroom. Um, uh, this is one of my, this is one of my, uh, more recent images is this is Zach wild. Uh, he played in a band where well, he plays in a lot of bands, but he, he, this was called generation X and we had a bunch of guitar players do a show and I'd never shot Zach before. And I was really looking forward to it. And we found out that the day of the show, we were only going to be able to shoot the first song up close and the rest of the show, we were going to be delegated to the back or the aisles or somewhere where we weren't going to annoy people. So I grabbed a 300 F4 that I have for emergencies and um, I shot this with a 300 F4 and you can't see his face, but man, his fingers and that guitar and the stack of Marshall amps just screamed to me. So it's become one of my, one of my favorite shots. And I did make sure that the focus was, was right here. I mean, it's right on the fingers on the guitar neck. Um, and I made sure that the whole guitar was in the picture. Um, it just, uh, it, again, I'm, I, I, if you look at that, you know that he's just shredding that guitar. There's no doubt about it. I don't need to have um, his face in there. The hair actually just kind of adds to it. Yeah, yeah. And, and the stack of amps just kind of screams yeah. big sound. <laughs> right. I mean, there's, there's nothing more rock and roll than a giant stack of amps and speakers behind you. I mean, it's, it's, it's like if I see that on a stage, it's, I will position myself so that I can get the musician in front of it because that just screams rock and roll. Um, I shot Motorhead and it was the same thing behind Lemmy was this giant stack of amps. And, uh, I, a lot of bands that do the, the more heavy metal, they like to have all those cabinets and, and up there. And because we had five different guitar players with five different sets of stuff, they, all these were being used. Um, but it just, for a background, it's just fantastic. Um, and it screams, you know, there's nothing, nothing to me, nothing screams rock and roll more than a stack of amps. And, uh, 
I might be biased, but martial amps are, you know, they're just, they're rock and roll. And I totally coincident, coincidental was this little martial here on the bottom underneath the guitar. I didn't realize that I had gotten it exactly there. Um, yeah, it's one, perfect. Yeah. One of the things about shooting at F4 though, is that, you know, an F2.8, especially from that distance is that the background does, you know, nicely blur out. So if this Marshall was in, you know, sharp, clear focus, I think it would actually detract from the image. Um, and then I might actually go into Photoshop and kind of blur the background a little bit. Um, this one, uh, is uh, Selena Gomez shot at the Valley View Casino Center a couple of weeks ago. This was shot from the soundboard. Um, again, I, I used uh, I used that uh, 300 f4. Um, I don't have a 400 28. I, I sometimes get it in as a loaner from Nikon, but uh, this there just wasn't enough time for this time to get it in this time. Um, what was really nice about the show was that the lighting was fantastic, especially this kind of backlighting on the hair coming in. And, um, she's such an animated performer. She used to, I shot her, I think three times now. Um, and she's every time I've seen her grow as a performer and the pure emotion in the shot, especially the focus on the clutching hand, um, just screamed to me. I'm like, this. as I was going through my edits, this one just jumped right out as like, she's really giving it her all on the stage. And, um, that's something that I like to see. And I know that the fans like to see is when the performer's actually like not dialing it in when you really when you're really giving it. So, um, that became just one of my favorite shots of the night. Sometimes I shoot from the back of the room, uh, when I can, this is a, a band called cage elephant and, um, their lighting was just, I, I just couldn't get enough of this guy's lighting because there's no video boards. There's no video feeds. There's no, there's nothing but light for the background. Uh, and I was just super impressed with how he could set the tone, um, how he could get the energy going, how the lighting director was actually controlling um, some of the way the fans are feeling just by using light, not by using a video yeah. screen. You know, a lot of the new, and I, and I don't get you wrong, man, if I go to a concert and I pay a hundred, two hundred dollars for a ticket, and I want a big video screen so I can actually see the performer, especially if I'm sitting at the back. But this was a little different. Um, and uh, I, you know, it was just a really, really cool shot. And we were allowed to shoot uh, the first three songs in the pit and then we were allowed to shoot from the house. So I went to the back and I was standing um, up on the upper level shooting down and the bottom of the image right here, there's actually the soundboard. Um, but again, I, this is probably shot at 70 millimeter just to give it a little bit more compression. Um, and it gives you kind of a good idea of what the whole stage looked like. And it was uh, definitely one of my favorites from the night. Yeah. Well, I, I also like the, um, the way that the uh, the light from the stage is spilling out on the the crowd yeah with with the fact that he's got this little ego ramp that comes out and the lighting trusses came out over that meant that the light would come down onto the fans and you could get all this motion and all this action going on and his fans were um they the show started at seven o'clock at night and the op i think the opening band took the stage at eight and they came on at nine these fans in the front were out in the parking lot camping out at six o'clock in the morning, five o'clock in the five o'clock in the morning. When I got there that evening, they were like, dude, the fans have been out here since before we got here this morning. I think the first fans showed up, I think five o'clock in the morning. So they were basically camping out to get into this front area because it was a general admission front. Um, uh, 14, 15 hours for a two hour concert. That's that's mm -hmm. dedication. Yeah, that's hardcore. That's hardcore. That's hardcore. I like that. I like that uh, terminology you just threw out there. The ego ramp. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, well, I'll flick back to it just for a second. That's that's kind of what a, uh, someone mentioned it to me once in a uh, way back when. It's always just stuck. It's the it's the ramp that comes from the stage out into the crowd. It was really popular at um, a lot of uh, country shows when I started shooting, it just seemed like that was the, the biggest thing to do. Rock and roll was always flat, but the country guys had this ramp that came out that they could walk down and, you know, be right in the crowd. And uh, the energy level between the performer and the crowd when they're packed around is really intense. Um, yeah. because you don't, you don't get to stand up front. Like you don't get to be in here and then just kind of stand there and look at the guy like, all right, come on, perform for me. These are rabid fans that want to be as close to possible and they give a lot of energy off. So if you're looking at this on the podcast and you can see my mouse, I'm standing, if I would be shooting, I'm standing right here against this ledge that runs right up front. 
So I'm actually right between the crowd and, and him performing. Uh, me, a bunch of other photographers, and some really big burly security guys are kind of crouched <laughs> down in this area. We don't want to be in the way, but we also have to make sure that no one uh, decides to jump up on stage or do something, you know, stupid. Yeah. That, that does happen. Um, this shot, which we've I bounced a lot of times. It's just that uh, this was flea at red hot chili peppers. And, um, it's kind of interesting. Uh, if you go back to the, um, if you think about the last shot I did, the Getty Lee from rush, the other bass player, you'll see that it's pretty much, I, this is how the style we did. This is another wall wrap in the building. Um, this is another shot a little wide. Um, uh, when I saw it, I, I realized that with these amps behind him and the bass going out, we could put this one up on a wall as well, really easily. Um, the interesting part about this is that that behind the light behind him was a screen. Um, but it wasn't just showing them. It was, uh, and when you get in really close, it just looks like a bunch of little squares. It's, it doesn't really have any kind of image to it. And I, in my brain, I, I look for patterns. They just show up. So the pattern here between the amp grid and then the grid on the wall and then the base kind of grid, everything kind of blended together. And, um, Again, it was just a, a motion flea is kind of interesting guy to shoot. He doesn't really stand still very often. Um, and the, the, the stare that he gave, the intensity um, in his facial expression just kind of, you know, sang to me, I guess. And um, so this became one of the other wall wraps that I was uh, really happy with. Cool. Um, this one's a little different. Uh, this is uh, a guy named Chris Broderick. He used to play um, in a bunch of heavy metal bands. He's got a new band of his own. Um, uh, but this was for a, a show called Metal Allegiance. And um, it was a bunch of musicians coming in and out of the show. There was probably 10 or 12 of them, and they were each playing different songs. They, were, they kept like coming on the stage and leaving the stage playing a couple of songs. And he came out and did the heavy metal um, you know, sign. And um, I caught this one, and I, I was just, the minute I saw it with the lights coming down and the guitar and everything, I'm like, this is great. Now, Normally, this guitar is white. Um, this is obviously the, the lighting was really, really, really warm. Um, I left it warm. I could have easily color corrected this and had it look more natural. But to me, it just kind of said the night this was shot at the House of Blues in Anaheim. So it was a much smaller venue um, with really just kind of a, a very orangey cast to it. And I really loved it. The interesting part about this shot to me is that I was shooting right next to one of my friends and we got the exact same moment. Like, like, we, but he he went horizontal and um the crop is different and i went vertical the cr the crop was different and because we were standing uh seven inches apart the part where his hand is intersecting his face on his shot this lower finger is actually covering his mouth because he was shooting just off to uh, my left so it was just fascinating oh, okay. about, i mean we were we were crammed in together right next to each other and yet we shot the exact same moment and the two images are not the same. And that's one of the things everyone's like, well, aren't you just worried about, you know, all the photographers in the pit and everyone getting the same shot. It's like you put 10 of us in the same area shooting the same thing. You're going to get 10 completely different images, even if they happen to be shot at exactly the same time. So it's all about, it's all about getting, you know, making your own style. I made sure that the guitar was not cut off. I made sure that it was, I kept the lights in. I, um, you know, that's just, to me, it's one of those things that you start developing your own style. When you start looking through my portfolio, you start seeing this kind of guitar neck going out of that angle a lot. It's just something that I, I, I tend to do. Um, and the last image uh, is Mr. Justin Bieber on the last tour. Um, and this was one of those things where I was shooting from the soundboard with a 400 millimeter lens. Um, and he came to the end of the ego ramp. He had a, he had a ramp that came out into the crowd. He came to the end and he kneeled down. And I was like, when I took this picture, I knew it was going to be my favorite shot of the night. And everyone's like, but it's a Justin Bieber shot. It's like, I, you know what? I might not listen to his music, but it's a, he's a really good performer. He puts on a really good show. The light was great. And to me, it was a really good moment. Um, and I, people are like, what about all the cell phone cameras? I'm like, well, that's to me, that's part of the moment. It's a live performance. So, I don't mind that there's all these little cameras and recorders up front. Um, I'm tall enough and I was standing on a, um, a box so that I was above them. I'd be a little more upset if the cameras were blocking my shot of his face or his hands. But, um, you know, this is, a, this is a pretty much just a crop version. If I was going to edit this, I would probably burn in some of the edges to keep the attention more on him. But uh, that's just a couple of the, a couple of the shots that I, I, wanted to, I wanted to show and talk about. Um, ranging, you know, from heavy metal to Justin Bieber. Um, 
<laughs> right, right, right. Yeah, it is a range. So I do a lot of my post processing in Lightroom. Um, not that I don't use Photoshop a lot, but I don't really get the luxury of editing a single image uh, for a long period of time. A lot of the stuff that I shoot has to be turned around and sent in really, really fast. Uh, I also don't have the luxury because a lot of times I'm shooting as a news person to edit anything. Um, it has to be straight out of the camera. I can't remove or add items. I can't move things around. Um, I can do slight uh, exposure adjustments. I can do, um, you know, a little bit of shadows. I can, I can do some things. So uh, what I wanted to show um, is a way that I have sped up my workflow immensely by having um, certain uh, Lightroom presets done, uh, but they're done per my camera bodies. And this is something that you can do in Lightroom really easily. So on the bottom of the screen, I have two images from Steel Pulse. The first one um, was taken, uh, this one was taken with my D4, uh, my Nikon D4, and the second one was taken with my Nikon D750. Those are the two cameras I use right now. Um, when I use a different camera, I'll, I'll do this uh, for those cameras too. So the idea is that um, I just bring this into a Lightroom catalog and I just bring in these two images. I make a catalog that I'm going to delete. I'm just going to work on these two and create a preset. And then I throw everything away and the preset stays. So uh, as you can see, everything is zeroed out. Um, I never touch the white balance in a preset because I want that to come in um, as shot. And what I usually do is I will push the clarity up to about 20 and I add a little vibrance. I always find that a, you know, a vibrant concert shot is better than a dull concert shot. Uh, next, I, uh, I will add a little contrast. I um, usually leave the highlights and shadows alone. I will adjust those per image when I go through and do the editing. Uh, the interesting thing about a concert shot is if I go from uh, the whites here and I go from zero all the way down to negative 100, you don't see much change in the image at all. If I go the other direction, you see a lot of change. So what I usually do is I usually bring the whites down to somewhere down in the, in the 90 range um, and 92, whatever. Uh, I leave the blacks alone. So that's the, that's the first one. The next one is I go into camera calibration and I take this off Adobe standard. I love Adobe, but their Adobe standard is not what I want it to look like. I want it to look like I looked in the back of my camera. I usually go with camera neutral. Um, you can see that. Mm -hmm. up the edges a little bit right off the bat. Um, that sits on camera neutral. And then on lens correction, the lens correction profiles are fantastic. And you can see that actually made everything just look a little bit better too. And um, I have those set. Now the last one is detail. So I go in the detail thing and, and uh, I add a little bit of sharpening just so that it, the rest of the controls um, become accessible. I'm putting about 20, 19. Now there's this little masking over here. And if you slide it around, it doesn't look like it does anything at all. So if you hold down the alt key, you can actually see what the masking is being uh, added, uh, what the sharpening is being added to. So it's only being added to the white stuff. I don't want the sharpening to be added to anything in the background. So I usually pull it out to about 80 or 90. I just want some sharpening added to the edges of the image and I'll put in, um, yeah, I don't know, 20 or 30, somewhere in that range. Then I add a little bit of noise reduction, which helps kind of soften the backgrounds a little bit, but because I've added sharpening in, the, the performer doesn't lose any of, any of that stuff. And it helps keep, it helps pop the performer out of the background just a little bit. It's a, it's a very small thing, but I like to add it here because I'll always forget to add it later. The reality is that the cameras nowadays are so good at, at high ISO that you don't really need to do uh, a lot to it at all. So now I have, this is kind of going to be the preset. It's obviously not the final image because it's still a little off, but this is kind of, I'm not going to set this so that it ha happens to every single time I bring in an image from that camera. And I just hold down the alt key and down over here where it said reset and you hold down alt and now it says set default. When I click it, it says, Hey, we're going to use this as the default for the Nikon D750. And more than that, it's only going to do it to my camera. This is the serial number for my camera, which I'll probably just, but once I update to, to that setting, every time I bring in a image that was shot with the, uh, my Nikon D750, these little presets are going to be applied to it. And I do the same that's, thing. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Well, I do the same thing now for the, for the D, uh, um, the D4 and, um, there, I, you know, I want the D4s and the D750 is a little bit different. I'm going to reduce the vibrance. I'm going to reduce the clarity a little bit. Um, 
uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm just going to tweak it so that it looks exactly the way I want to look. And what I'm trying to do here is I'm trying to make the two images look like they were shot by the same camera. I'm trying to match the D4 to the D750. So when you go through the images, you have no idea that I was using two different cameras. That's the general idea behind it. Um, mm -hmm. So if I have to come in here and I go, well, the portrait version on this one looks slightly different than the, you know, I'll, I'll do that. Um, and then I go in here, I hit alt and I set the default and now it's going to set the default for my Nikon D4 update to current setting. So and so, and, and so you're doing this in a, in a kind of a, a separate temporary catalog that just has these right. two images just so that you can create these uh, defaults for these cameras. That, that, yeah, you can do it on your regular catalog, but I, I, I tend to, to get confused with lots of stuff. And, you know, I'm, a, I'm kind of a simple guy. So for me, I just create a catalog um, that I'm going to do this with. I bring in two images that are representative of what I'm shooting with the camera. Um, and then I uh, create this and then I throw everything else away. Now you can come in here and create a preset. You can see that I've got a bunch of user presets in here. Um, you can do that every time you import if, you, if you're shooting something different. Um, to me, this one's just easier because not only does it uh, affect Lightroom import the whole time, it actually does something really cool um, for Photoshop. So if I go back to, um, I'm going to, I, I made a little catalog. And I've got some images here um, and I'm going to open one of them in Photoshop. I'm going to open up um, from the same show. I'm going to open up, whoop, I'm going to open up that one, I guess. And it's going to come here and I'm, it, open it up in Adobe Camera Raw. And um, as you can see, while it resizes itself, if I, um, it was shot with, this camera, these settings right over here are um, identical to the settings in Camera Raw right now. Um, oh, so Camera Raw is seeing that. Yeah, I, what I'm going to th that you have a preset for or a default setting for for that camera, so it's honoring it too. Yeah, it's exactly. It. I'm going to open that up again. Um, so when you save this in Lightroom, it's not it's not a catalog specific setting. It is going no. into into the Lightroom under the hood setting so that no matter what catalog you are working with, if you're, if it recognizes a picture from your Nikon D4 or your other Nikon, it, it matches the serial number and says, ah, I need to apply this default because that's what he set up. Exactly. So you can see as I've got them, I've got them lined up next to each other here. Um, not the same, not the same image, but shot with the same camera. Uh, the contrast is now at plus 18. Um, the whites are down to negative 89. The clarity is pushed up to plus 20 because I set the default in Lightroom and Camera Raw um, sees that. It sees my camera um, information that Lightroom has stored somewhere and it gives me the same basic starting point no matter what I open it up in. And to me, this saved huge amounts of time um, because I'm not, if I open up something in Camera Raw, I know it's going to open up the same way I would as my default in Lightroom. And working between the two becomes a lot faster and easier because I don't have to worry about, oh, or how did I start that image? What, you know, where did I start? It all just comes right in here. Um, and the, the interesting part is that if you go into Lightroom and you go into the settings, you can actually define, um, you can actually define, uh, you can have it set to do a default per ISO. So I could literally have a different setting when I'm shooting at 1600 ISO on the same camera and 3200 ISO and 6400 ISO. Now, to me, that's a little extreme and I don't usually go in that much, but it's, um, it can be done. And what that means is that every single time you open an image now using a uh, camera Raw or Lightroom, it's going to have those defaults set. It's, it's absolutely brilliant for um, when you, when you shoot the same thing a lot. Um, and it's even, more useful if you use more than one camera because you can get the two cameras to match each other uh, much closer than you can just by guessing. Yeah. So. And, and obviously I imagine for any situation where you're, you're kind of shooting in high volume amounts, that's going to save a lot of time. Right. That's, you know, a lot of people, you know, they're, they're working on one image or two images. Now I'm working uh, when I shoot for the venue and we shoot a show and I'm, I'm shooting three songs. I tend to overshoot there. They want, they'll post, 20 or 30 pictures to Facebook or their social media accounts. I'll usually post two or three, um, but they want about a hundred for the archives. 
they want to have yeah. a, a history of the show. So all those are going to be edited. All those are going to be set. All those are going to be exported as TIFFs. All of them need to look kind of the same. So when they're going through them a year or two years, three years from now, they can be, oh, yeah, this was, you know, they all, there's not like, oh, I wonder why this one looks different from that one. And they're, they're trying to figure all that stuff out. I'm trying to just make it look like everything was shot with the same thing and had the same look. Um, yeah. And no, it can really help you to, yeah, it can help you to find a look. And it's one of those things that just comes in and once you get used to it, it's, it's done all the time. Um, there's people always ask, you know, how much do I really edit a picture? So, uh, the reality is that I, I basically do a lot of cropping. Um, I, I always shoot a little wider than I want and I'll always crop in a little bit. That's usually my first, uh, edit. Um, yeah. I've, I've been bitten in the past by suddenly needing some extra space on the side of a picture or above a picture. Uh, and then I don't have it. So, um, I, I tend to, I tend to shoot a little wider than I, than I did in the past and I will always crop in. So that's, uh, that's bad. And the other two things that I do a lot of, um, cause I learned in a dark room and I still have kind of that mentality, uh, is that I will dodge and burn. And a lot of times, um, that's all it really takes to kind of take the picture up just that little extra bit. Um, I use a nice big brush and we'll just kind of, um, I usually do it on its own. I just copy the image to duplicate it. And then I will come in and kind of burn around the edges a little bit. Um, just to keep the, the, uh, attention right on the middle. Now, this image has a, has a problem. Um, it's this little bright area right up here in the corner. It drags the eye away. Uh, yeah. So uh, uh, now it's gone. And I will just yeah, just a little bit of a crop. Just there. a little bit of a crop. And and everyone is like, and I used to be one of those guys who everything had to be to the the same crop format as the camera. And I've learned that that's kind of ridiculous. You, I, you know, I now crop for the walls, which are look more like a widescreen TV. I crop for Instagram, which is square. I, I crop because I, I want to, I do panoramics. Everything is long and thin. So, um, just so long as the image stays, you know, um, where I'm keeping the attention, uh, that's all that really matters. And, and the, you know, then I will come in and I can really kind of, I'm using a Wacom tablet. So every time I, I re release, I'm, I'm painting over the same areas over and over and over again, just burning in the darkness. Um, and you can tell from the settings up top that I'm only affecting the shadows and I'm only doing it at about 19%. I'll actually take that down about 15%. And then I'm protecting the tones. Yeah. So if I go over something too much, it's not going to be crazy. Um, but you get Plus, since you have it on a separate layer, you, you could always uh, uh, modify the layer opacity if you wanted to back it off a little bit, too. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, I, and it, it also gives me sometimes you get tunnel vision. You know, I'll be working on something and honestly, I'll be, you know, up here and I'll be in really close and I'll be like, oh, did that, you know, did that work? And then I realize I've completely gone overboard. So being able to go and, you know, toggle it off and, and look at what I started with really helps, um, you know, uh, not going crazy. The idea is yeah. not to go crazy. The idea is just to be a really subtle kind of um, uh, area. So I'm, so I'm keeping the attention on the performer. I mean, I picked a really odd shot to do it on, but it was just I wanted to show the settings of, of um, how. Sure, sure, there. yeah. And there's just one last thing, and this is, this is uh, the new Adobe, you know, mobile is great um, concept. And I'm, I tend to process one or two images on my phone now when I'm leaving a concert. My D750 has a built-in Wi-Fi transmitter, so I can actually send it directly to my phone and edit images on my phone and send them to my boss before I've left the building, which they love because they can put that right up on, um, you know, Facebook or Instagram instantly while the show is still going on. And it's not a cell phone picture. It's an actual DSLR image that's been properly edited. Um, but one of the really nice things is this new little li my libraries part um, that they have. So I have my own little, uh, little watermark in here. And um, it's not only accessible in here, it's also accessible uh, on Lightroom and Photoshop on, the, uh, on my iPhone. So I can actually just grab the same uh, graphic and have my branding across all my images, no matter where I edit them. So I'm not, I know I'm not, yeah, using, I know I'm not using the mobile, mobile stuff to its full advantage yet, but for me, this is one of those things that I'm sitting on a bus coming back from um, Comic-Con and I want to post something and I want to actually have my brand on it. So if it gets shared or someone sees it, they know that I took it. 
uh, I was able to just bring up my actual um, logo um, that's stored as a PNG in, um, in my libraries. And it was right there on my phone. Um, and it's right there with me all the time. So even if you don't use all and, the and mobile so, stuff. Right. And just for clarification, what, what, uh, what Adobe mobile app are you using to add that to the picture on your phone? Uh, I used, um, that's a really good question because they kept changing the names on me. I've been using the mobile apps forever. So I was using a, a combination of Photoshop mix and Photoshop fix. Um, I was using both right, of them. Yeah. And, uh, um, I, I, I don't use Lightroom Mobile as much yet anymore, uh, as much yet anymore. I don't use <laughs> Lightroom Mobile as much because I tend to make a separate catalog for each event I shoot. Um, I, shoot yeah. I shoot a ton of events, uh, having them all in one catalog um, kind of drives me crazy. So I tend to have separate catalogs for each, uh, each event, um, which means that I would yeah. have to unsync and resync each time. So I haven't quite got to that point yet. Um, I'm sure I'm going to get there. It's, it's just not part of my work yet, but I do use um, both the uh, Photoshop fix and mix and um, they've got some really cool apps. I mean, some of the stuff was, was, I was really impressed with. I've had a lot of fun playing with it. Um, the spark yeah. post and the, you know, the Adobe preview and all that kind of uh, Adobe comp. Um, and I think it's Adobe and capture. I was just going to say, just, just to clarify for people uh, what, you, what you can do and what, what Alan is, is able to do here in terms of adding his, his brand uh, you know, logo there to the images is that when you are working in Photoshop Mix um, or Photoshop Fix, uh, you, know, you have your image open, but then you can, you can also bring in a new layer and you can choose uh, you know, images from your camera roll on your iPad or your phone, or you can go out and, and look at what... Uh, assets and elements you have stored in your library on your creative cloud, you know, folder up, up, a, up in the cloud as it were, and you can just grab that. So that's how he's able to, to grab his logo here. Cause he has saved that as a library element. Yes. And it also, I mean, back to actually working on Photoshop, my desktop, I used to lose it all the time. I used to forget which folder I'd put my logo in. Um, so <laughs> I used to, yeah, I know I'm the same way. <laughs> so I, I'd have to like, okay, I know it's on one of the network drives and I'd have to go to the, Oh, you know, it was a network one or two. And then I'd have to go look for the logos folder and then I'd have to go find it. And then I'd have to drag it in and resize it. Now it's just sitting right here. Um, you know, in my library's, uh, folder right on right all the time. So I never have to go look for it. I can always just grab it and, 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 um, slam it into an image. Uh, and I'm, uh, not a huge proponent of sticking your copyright over the middle of a shot, but I am, I am a guy who believes in branding. And so I'd like to have, you know, when I'm putting stuff out, I like to have this little logo sitting on the bottom over here. I think it doesn't detract from the image. Uh, you probably won't see, you, you might see stuff from like 2010, but you won't see, you know, this anymore. Um, right. Yeah. I, I don't, I don't do that. You know, anymore. I think that's kind of a distracting uh, look to have my name, you know, plastered all over the middle of the image. Um, yeah. 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 I, I agree with you. Too. you know, it, down kind of, you know, subtle and understated in the corner is all you need. Yeah. And, it, and it, you know, I'm not as well known as, you know, Joe McNally or, you know, Moose Peterson or some of the guys who you look at their images and you're like, I know that's, you know, I know he took that. So I like to have my name on the bottom. So that when someone does see it, you know, it starts building kind of that brand awareness. Um, and uh, I, I love the idea that I can find it every single time I open up Photoshop. I know exactly where it is. Um, yeah, yeah. I know the library's feature is really cool. I've been yeah. getting into it recently as well. Yeah. Well, a lot of people, you know, it's a, it's a lot of times it's like I don't use Photoshop for a lot of different stuff. I use it for the same stuff over and over and over again. And if they made it, they just made it faster for me to do that, which I really appreciate because yeah. that's kind of where I need to be. Um, you know, I, I want speed. I don't really need to have um, more 3D tools. I mean, they're, they're fun. I just don't use them. So it's, it's cool when they have them. But for me, having my library accessible everywhere is, was like one of those, oh, great, I can, I can start adding logos. And um, I have other libraries for other clients. And so I, can, I don't mix them up yet. I can, I can drop down. And when I work with the Sports Arena, I can you know, drop their logo on it too. Um, but I don't have to go find it. <laughs> I, it's right yeah, there. Yeah, no, no, no. It's so. definitely, definitely convenient technology. We we yeah. love convenient technology. Well, you know the the yeah for me it's all about speed. So I I need to get things done yeah, yeah. fast.
Well, that was really cool, Alan. Um, and I'm, I'm glad you shared that little tip about that kind of creating the, the default interpretation for, for certain cameras. Uh, I can see how that would be really useful in, in some situations such as what you experience. Great stuff. Yeah, it, it's uh, thanks. I mean, it's, it's one of those things that just makes the workflow faster. You're not trying to edit um, two different, you know, looks on the whole time. And it, it's really speeded things up um, for my editing. So, right. Um, great, great. So where can people find out more about you out there on the web? Uh, my website is uh, alanhessphotography.com. It's the basically the hub for everything. I write a blog. Um, uh, as regularly as I can, uh, or at least when I think there's something interesting to actually write about. Uh, every, right. Everything else is linked from there. There's an Instagram account. There's a Twitter. There's a um, Facebook stuff. But it's all alanhessphotography.com is is the best place to go. It'll also list all the books that I've done. Um, and I have a new book coming out uh, later this year um, for Rocky Nook. It's uh, a new series called The Enthusiast's Guide Two, and I did a book on a multiple um, exposures. So it covers things like, oh, cool. uh, yeah, it's, it's not a, it's, I mean, it, it's, it's, in, it's 49 things you need to know about multiple exposures. So it covers some HDR and some, some technically multiple exposures, uh, some double exposures, some, uh, time-lapse stuff, some image stacking, uh, things like that. So I'm looking forward to that. It's a new series. Um, uh, hopefully it'll, it'll, people will like it. Uh, you can, you can see the information on Amazon right now. And there's actually a website called the enthusiast guide.com, I believe, or just look under Rocky Nook and you can, and is that there. is that due out later this year? Uh, I think the publication, years? yeah, I think the publication date is November. Um, I believe that's what Amazon is um, is saying is that it's coming out in, in November. I know that if you go to Rocky Nook and you look up Enthusiast Guide, right now there's a uh, fifteen. There's three books coming out in the series, and there's a there's a fifteen tip like uh, free ebook that you can sign up for. So it's got five tips from me and five tips from uh, each of the other two authors in the first three books of the series. So. Um, cool. We're cool. really kind of excited about that. It should be, it should be interesting. Um, and there's a, uh, I did a Kelby one class on shooting concerts. Uh, we mentioned it earlier. Um, uh, we built it out of the, uh, out of the pre-con that Scott DeUsa and I did. So Scott DeUsa and I actually teach it. It's on Kelby one, um, dot com. Just look up concert photography or Alan Hess. Uh, maybe I'll do something else with them in the future, but right now the concert one is, is my class and it's, it's what I'm known for. So, uh, it's a fun two hour okay. class. So it's, <laughs> we're, we're one of the last two hour classes. We, uh, we put a lot of information in, in that, uh, in that class. So we're really Great. happy with it. Well, I'll put, I'll put a link to that in the show notes. And of course, a link to your, your website uh, where people can find all that other information. And yeah. apropos Rocky Nook, since you mentioned it, it reminded me to remind our viewers and listeners that we uh, are still in the middle of our current Rocky Nook book giveaway. Um, that book giveaway, the entries close on Tuesday, August 23rd at the end of day Pacific standard time. So, um, to find out the details of how you can enter to win the Rocky notebook of your choice, um, just go to the previous episodes page, episode 78 with Dan Hughes, where we talked about Mac fun tonality pro, oh, yeah. and you can figure out how to enter to win the Rocky notebook of your choice. And you know, if you want to get Alan's book, even though it's not out, I mean, we can put your name on a list and send it to you when it comes out. So just remember that that's coming up. The, the website um, for the Enthusiast Guides is actually www.enthusiastsguides.com. And we'll uh, make sure you have a link to that in the, in the notes too. Cool. Yeah, definitely put that yeah. in there. Great. Well, excellent. Excellent. I, I learned a lot. Uh, something that it's kind of a, a vicarious thrill because I think, you know, all of us who have been to concerts, but who haven't actually maybe photographed really big high energy concerts have wondered maybe what that would be like. So it was great to get a, a peek behind the curtain from somebody who, uh, who has a lot of experience with that. So thanks a lot. Oh, it's my pleasure. All right. Take care. We'll see you around. See ya. All right. Well, thank you out there in internet land for joining me here on the fix. Uh, remember, you can subscribe to the show. There's a subscription box on the right side of the page. And if you want to send us any feedback or suggestions about topics you'd like to see uh, covered on future shows, or maybe photographers you'd like to see inter interviewed about their images and their process, uh, there's a click on that contact us link at the top of the page and choose the fix and we will get your information. Take care. We'll see you next week on the fix. Mm -hmm.